This morning, let me encourage you to take your Bibles as we look in the Gospel of Luke. And our foundational text is going to be coming from Luke chapter 2. And it will start with chapter 21. So if you have your Bibles, let's go ahead and look together. Luke chapter 2, starting with verse 21. Today I want to speak to you about a gentleman that is one of the probably considered a minor cast members. If you were to write a Christmas production, you would definitely have the baby Jesus and Mary and Joseph and the wise men and the, and the shepherds and King Herod. But so many times the individual I want to speak to you about today is left out. And if he is mentioned, it's just a little side note. But it's a very important part, and the reason why is because he is actually going to be declaring who Jesus is and what he was waiting for his entire life. And so let's look today about the story of Simeon and how he meets Jesus and what it implicates for you and I today. Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, starting in verse 21. When the eighth day had were completed for his circumcision... He was named Jesus, and the name given to him by the angels before he was conceived. And when the days of purification according to the laws of Moses were finished, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. And just as it was written of the law, every firstborn male will be dedicated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to Israel's consolation. And the Holy Spirit was on him. And he had been revealed by him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death, before he saw the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, he entered into the temple complex. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to perform for him what was customary under the law, Simeon looked at him and took him into his arms, and he praised God by saying these words, Now, Master, you can dismiss your slave in peace as you promised. For my eyes have seen your salvation, and you have prepared it in the presence of all people, a light of revelation to the Gentiles, and glory to your people Israel. His father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. And then Simeon blessed them and told his mother Mary, Indeed, this child is destined to cause the fall and rise of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed, and a sword will be pierced of your own soul, and there the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. May God bless the reading of this word. So, what do we have? We have a time period in which Jesus has been circumcised on the eighth day, and they officially announce his name. We know the angels have already uh, said what his name was going to be. They didn't have to go and look at a baby name book of thinking, what does this name mean? What will we name him? They didn't even have to be concerned about it. God already had the name of his son. His name is Jesus. We know Emmanuel, God with us. And so being under the Jewish law, they go on the eighth day to offer this circumcision of the firstborn son. And so in doing this, it's amazing that probably about 40 days later, because you have to study Jewish tradition and know what the Hebrew roots are, about 40 days a woman who has had birth was not allowed into the temple complex. And so if you're wondering when this happened, it was probably 40 days after Christ had been born that Mary and Joseph take this baby Jesus to the temple. And why? Because they want to offer a offering and have this baby dedicated. It's a, it's a wonderful baby dedication picture that's going to take place. And so while they're going, it is required by Jewish law that they are to present an offering. Now, if you look in Leviticus, and if you don't uh, want to turn, you can just write it down for later. In Leviticus chapter 12, verse 8, it says that on your firstborn son, you are to offer a lamb to be sacrificed as a sin offering, as a dedication offering. But it says if you cannot afford that, 
that you can offer two turtle doves or two pigeons. And so it was saying there was no reason why anyone shouldn't be able to come and thank God for the birth of their son and then also offer a offering to God. Now, Mary and Joseph do not bring a lamb. If you notice, it says that they come and they bring, it says the following, it says verse 24, it says according to the law that they come and bring either two turtle doves or two young pigeons in verse 24. My first point is this, is it's the idea Luke is saying, Mary and Joseph are not rich. Mary and Joseph, you remember the wise men come after Jesus had been born. He, they visit him in a house. He was probably about you know a year or two old, years old. And they go and then they give gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But when there Jesus is born, he's born to a very humble circumstances. Uh, and so what we see is that they don't bring a lamb. But then I think about going 30 years later, whenever Moses, or excuse me, my Sunday school lesson, our teacher was talking about Moses, and I'll say my mind's still on that. Uh, when, whenever, our, uh, 30 years later, John the Baptist, that's a big difference from Moses, uh, that when John the Baptist sees Jesus, he says, Behold, the Lamb of God. And so even though Mary and Joseph are presenting this offering of two uh, doves or, or the two turtle doves, what do we see here? We see that it says that they are bringing Jesus also. Unknowingly, they are bringing the Lamb of God to the temple when they didn't think they could afford it, God had provided for it. Now, I, you're not, I know some of you that's not getting excited, but let me just tell you this. Where you don't think you have what it takes to come before God, God's already provided it. Where you think that the only thing you have is just a little turtle doves or, or pigeons, God's already provided the ultimate sacrifice. He's already given you Jesus. And so he's presented that to you, the Lamb of God. And so when we read this biblical account and we say, well, look at Mary and Joseph, they're poor, they go up there, they only have these two birds, and, and they don't have a lamb. But they didn't even realize they did have the lamb. They had the lamb of God. They had Jesus Christ. And not only did God give them this gift, but there had been a man who was at advanced age. And he was told that, look, you're not going to die until a promise was fulfilled. And the promise was that he would actually get to see the Messiah. He would get to see the deliverer of Israel. Now, it's amazing that whenever we're getting older, if the doctor said, now you're not going to die until something happens, you'd probably think to yourself, man, I don't want it to happen then. I don't want to die, so I don't want this thing to happen. But you know, I've seen in my years of ministry, I've seen older folks say to me, Pastor, if I can just live long enough to see my grandchildren graduate from college. Or pastor, if I could just live long enough to know that my daughter is made success of herself. Or pastor, if I could live long enough and then you fill in the blank. You've heard people make that statement, have you? I've seen even on deathbed people say, if I could just live long enough for someone in the family that they hadn't seen to come and visit them while they're dying. And then what happens, it seems a little bit later on, it seems like they get what they were wanting, and they do go on and pass into glory. You've seen that before. So Simeon is someone that has been told, you're not going to die until you see the Messiah. And so this man's excited because while he's in advanced stage, he's probably 70 or 80 years old, he, his skin is wrinkled, he's got a, a, a beard because in Jewish tradition they didn't cut their beards, they let their beards grow. And so he is an old man, he goes into the temple and the Holy Spirit says, you're going to see the Messiah. And that excites him. Why? Because he knows that whenever he sees the Messiah, that in doing so, God's fulfilled a promise. Well, you know, God's fulfilled a promise for you and I. The promise is that when we see the Messiah, that we also will be able to see God. When we see the Messiah, we will be able to die happy. Folks, we don't want to think about dying. I know that. I stood at the graveside of someone yesterday and did a funeral service, and you bring words of hope and comfort, but no one really wants to dwell on dying. But here what we see is that Simeon, he's waited his entire life for this. And in verse 25, it says that it gives us a description. 
It was a man in Jerusalem. So he's in the capital city of Israel. His name is Simeon. The man was righteous and devout. So we learned that about him. What makes him special? What makes him special is that he was a believer in God. He was looking forward to the blessing of Israel. Well, the Holy Spirit comes. Some say, well, the Holy Spirit only came at the day of Pentecost. But you know, at the very beginning of time, the Holy Spirit has been there. The Holy Spirit was there with Jesus and God himself, the Trinity, was there. And here the Holy Spirit moves on this old man. I'm going to let you know, friends, God will still move on you and you don't have to be a young whippersnapper for him to move. There's some of you right now that might have arthritis, tendonitis, jointitis, and gingivitis, but God can still move on you. Some of you need to shake a little leg and say, thank you, God, that you can still move on me, right? Some of you don't know what you do if the Holy Spirit jumps on you. I love to see it. I love to see the Holy Ghost get on some of you. Amen? The point I'm getting at is that this old man, Simeon, and I don't say that as an insult, but this man, Simeon, that what happens, he says, I'm going to get excited because God's going to fulfill a promise. How many of you know God's going to fulfill a promise for you? It says in verse 26, it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he saw the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit. Notice this the next thing. It's not Simeon just saying, any, many, mighty, mo, I'm going to pick one of these people to come in the temple to be the next Messiah. No, it's the Holy Spirit guiding him. What guides us 2,000 years later from this event? It's the Holy Spirit. If you're trying to do it on your own, you will fail. But if you say, Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. Holy Spirit, Guide me in what I need to do. He will guide you at work. He will guide you at school. He will guide you at home. And here it says that he was guided by the Holy Spirit. He entered the temple complex. Why? Because the Holy Spirit told him to go there. Notice this. This old man named Simeon, he still went to church. Oh, I hear some people say, well, I'm getting at the age now. I just need to stay home. But it's amazing, though, they got a cell down at Belk. I don't care how old you are, you get your walker and go down there. Right. Now, come on. Right. I had to get on my grandma because it, I called her one Sunday, and I said, you go to church, Grandma? And she said, no, it was raining today, so I didn't go. Just had my hair done. And, you know, man, Grandma's got a relationship. I can go back and forth with her like that. And I said, well, Grandma, I said... If there was a big sale down at Walmart, I guarantee you, hair wet or not, you'd have thrown on your bonnet and you would have gotten the car and you'd have went. Now, James Kenneth, now don't be saying all of that. <laughs> but she knew it was true. And the reason why I could tease with her about that is because that's human nature. A lot of times we get a little bit older and we say, I can't, them pews are so hard. And sometimes the pews can be hard. And if it's too hard, you're sitting down and you need to stand up and say hallelujah and sit back down. I'll know it's because the pew was a little too hard for you this morning. <laughs> All right. Some of you getting scared now. Yeah. The point I'm getting at is that this man didn't allow his age to stop him. Why? Because he was looking and anticipating a blessing even at an old age. Whew. It says this, that when the parents had brought Jesus, notice this, they come in there as customary. You know, people want to throw tradition out the window. Uh, I like some tradition. Some of you say, I don't want tradition. Well, you get up in the morning, you brush your teeth, you, you clothe yourself. Uh, that's tradition, you do that. I know you say, well, that's routine. Well, routines can be tradition too. And here it says that he sees them going into the complex. They're about to make the offering. They, and he says that when he sees this, they brought the child Jesus and performed for, for him what was customary under the law. And Simeon took him in the arms. Now, folks, I'm about to have a baby and my wife and I in March. And if we're about to do a baby dedication, and I don't know this man. They didn't know who he was. They weren't from Jerusalem. They go up in there to pay their respects. They go up there to do their offering. And this guy comes up there and just takes the baby out of Mary's hands. Now, can't you imagine the look on Mama's face? Any of you ever had a baby? And what would you think? Now, do, I'm going to ask you, don't answer it out loud because some of you might not want to be embarrassed. But how many of you know there's some people when you had your baby, you didn't want them to be holding your baby? Now, y'all want to be truthful in church. 
Come on. There's some people I don't want holding my baby. Do what? He's a gift from God, but there's some people you don't hold your baby. I guarantee you down there at Walmart and this homeless man come up to you and take your baby, you ain't going to want just anybody in there but holding your baby. And if, if that's the case, then something you need to think about that because you got to be, we're a little protective over babies, aren't we? Yeah. A stranger comes and grabs the baby. But notice what he says. Was something different about Jesus than it was any other baby? Was there? Did Mary and Joseph know there was something different about Jesus? Oh, come on now. Born of a virgin. Holy Spirit told them what to name the child. The angels did that, right? There was something different. And so all of this is playing right into the what? The plan of God. Is it not? Simeon takes the baby and it says this. He's going to make a declaration. He doesn't take the baby and run. He takes the baby and starts praising God. Now, will things change a little if somebody takes your baby and then they, instead of doing something crazy with your baby, they take your baby and start praising God for that baby? You'd be like, that's, that's okay. I like that. I like that they're praising God and thanking God for my baby. The tension is a little bit lowered. Remember, this is their firstborn babe. This is their first. Mary has other children, does she not? Yes. But this is the first child. So I, it's funny, see parents, the first child so many times, so protective, and then the second child, you know, just dragging them on by the arm. Not, not, you, got, you got it under pat, right? Come the fifth, sixth child, you know, you just leave them at home sometimes. <laughs> the point I'm getting at, this is a very special baby. But notice that Simeon says, Now, Master, you can dismiss your slave in peace. Let me put it in translation for us. He's saying, God... I can die right now. You know why? Because you have fulfilled your promise. Folks, if you've got Jesus in your life and you've had an experience with the Almighty, you can die right now and it'd be okay. Now, yes, the family that you leave behind is going to be hurting. I know that. That's not natural. But if you know Jesus, you can die in peace. Can you not? Yes. It's sad, but you can still die in peace. It says in verse 30, notice this, the next thing. So the first point is if you know Jesus, in verse 29, you can go in peace. Are you ready to go in peace? If you know Jesus, if you don't know Jesus, then you're not ready to go in peace. Verse 30, for my eyes have seen your what? He doesn't say my eyes have seen this beautiful baby. But my eyes have seen your salvation. Jesus came to set the captive free. You might say, well, I want Jesus to heal me. I want Jesus to do X, Y, and Z. The purpose of Jesus was to save you from your sins. Can He heal you? Yes. Can He bless you? Yes. But what is the purpose? Salvation. Everything else is icing on the cake. It says, for my eyes have seen your salvation. You have prepared it in the presence of all people. Now, verse 32 is kind of going to take many people off by surprise. Remember, they are looking for a a Messiah for Israel. But then Simeon says, a light for revelation to the Gentiles. Wait a minute. You mean to tell me that this baby who is the symbol of salvation is being brought into this world not just for the religious Jews... He's being brought in for the Samaritan woman at the well. Come on now. He's being brought in for the man who is a paralytic that his friends had to tear up the roof and let him down. He's being born for the ten that had leprosy and the one who came back to praise. He was being born not just for those who played the part, looked the part. He was being born for the most sinful person there could ever be. And that's me and you. He was born for us. And so this Christmas we can say thank you God because even Simeon at an old age was able to say this was for the Gentiles. And not only for the Gentiles, but he says also, it says for the glory of your people Israel. So even Simeon got it. How does Simeon know this? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit guided him and knowing what to say in praise. Now verse 33, his father, Joseph, his mother Mary, were amazed. 
Why were they amazed? Because of what this man was saying. It is a matchup to what the angels were saying. It was a matchup to what has been said in the past. How many of you know that when you hear one person say it, that, okay, I can accept that. Then you start hearing another say it and another say it. Something starts getting with it, clicking together. And here what we see is that now it's another testimony. If we were going to read a little bit further on, you'd find there's an older woman named Anna that is a prophetess. She was in the temple and she sees the baby Jesus, says she jumps up and starts proclaiming that the Messiah is here. Everyone's excited when you get in the presence of the Lord. Amen. I wish everyone today was excited. Then Simeon blessed them and told his mother Mary, Indeed, this child is destined to cause the fall and rise of many in Israel. Stop there for a moment. So Simeon continues with the prophetic message. He says, This child will cause many in Israel to fall. Now, it's not just meaning, and you say, well, of course, we're talking about the religious leaders, we're talking about the Roman government, but I want to let you know this, is that every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, this Savior will cause many to fall. And yes, we can look at it as the fall in a negative way, but also you think of this, we think about falling down in the presence of God. But then it says he will also cause many to be risen up, to rise in many of Israel. So those that will be let down and those that will be picked up. It says, and it will be a sign that, will be, that he will be opposed. Well, how many of you understand that even from the birth of Jesus to the time he actually died on the cross, he was opposed by many. You think you're being opposed by somebody at work? Oh, you, you ain't seen nothing compared to what Jesus had to put up with. Do you think you're being opposed by family members at Christmas time? You know, sometimes Christmas is a hard time for families. They get together and, and they had to put on fake smiles, some of them, and they get mad at each other and don't speak to each other throughout the whole year. But I'll tell you this, is that nothing like what Jesus went through can ever be compared. What we go through is nothing compared to what Jesus went through. And then it says, and a sword will pierce your own soul. Talking about Mary. Mary watches her son executed. This baby that she takes, think of it, the baby she takes to the temple. Some 40 some days after his birth. She will watch 33 years later, she will be at the cross and watch him cry out. My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? She'll watch him cry out. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. She will watch him cry out to one of the men on the cross. Today you will see me in paradise. Come on now. She will watch him cry out on the cross. It is finished. It is done. Do you think Mary cried? Do you think it bothered Mary watching her naked son on the cross? He was not, we have pictures of him clothed on the cross or something covering up. That's not how it was. They, the humiliation of the cross was part of the nakedness and being beaten and, and being battered and bruised and the crown of thorns and Mary's down there with some of the other women and only one of the disciples of Jesus even showed up and it was John and Mary's down there crying and Jesus while on the cross, he even looks at John and, and says, John, you see my mother? Take care of her. It's all of that's part of the, of the gospel message. And so was her heart pierced? Yes. Was she hurt? Yes. But how many of you know, three days later, the Lamb of God, Amen. the Lamb of God continued to live. It says the sword would pierce your own soul, and then the very last part it says that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. You know what? God right now, as we get ready to close up, God right now knows what's in our hearts. He knew what was in the heart of Simeon, and that's why Simeon was blessed to see the baby Jesus. He knows what's in your heart. He knows when you come and approach the church and to come and approach what you want from God. You might say, I wonder why when that person comes to church, they always come and, and it seems like they leave. They leave like they're on cloud nine. Maybe it's because in their hearts they were looking for cloud nine before they even got here. That they're saying, Lord, I'm so excited I get to get ready for church today. Some of us treat going to church like we do treat going to work on Monday. 
And then we wonder why we don't get the blessings at church because we don't get the blessings at work. I will tell you this, the God who made Sunday is the God who made Monday, and we should praise him even on Monday instead of saying, oh, poor pitiful me, I'm ready for Friday. Rejoice in the day God's given you because you never know. It might be that Monday your life is totally changed and transformed, not by simply the babe of Jesus, but the crucified Christ who will return again. Jesus comes back on a Monday. I, I tell you, some of us would be upset because we're like, oh, it's such a pitiful me, Monday. But thank God for every day, because why? He knows and will reveal our hearts. God knows you better than you know yourself. Does he not? God has given Simeon this blessing at this time of year. Why? Because he knew Simeon. That's all he wanted. Lord, please let me just see the Messiah. Lord, please let me see the Messiah. And we don't know, the Bible doesn't say how many years he waited. We don't know how many years this is part of the routine going every day looking for a blessing. Some of you right now have been praying for something for a long time and you're saying, Lord, it still hasn't happened. Don't give up. Maybe there's Christmas you've been praying instead of saying, Lord, I sure hope I get, and you fill in the blank. I promise you whatever gift you get that's tangible this year and the years to come, it could be stolen. The rust could get it. The dust can destroy it. The mold, the moth, all of those things can happen. But if you have the gift of salvation, you have something that will never grow old. Some of you in here are older than 50, 60, 70, 80 years old. Some of you are up here up in age. Your body doesn't work quite like it used to. But there's something on the inside... I'm going to just preach this for about 60 more seconds. There's something on the inside that's still vibrant. Amen. Oh, come on now. Yeah. You, you might feel like when you get up, oh, my back's hurting, my legs are hurting, everything's hurting. But you know what? There's something on the inside. If you're a child of God, you're still, you got a spirit inside of you that's going to live forever. You might be hurting on the outside, but friends, maybe you need to just be rejoicing because of what dwells on the inside. Simeon in his old age still was able to say hallelujah. And some of us are afraid to even say amen. You see, the thing is today is that if we come to God with a spirit of expectation, no, it might not happen that very moment. But it will happen. God can answer your prayers. Right now, if you have a loved one that's not saved, will you pray this Sunday before Christmas, Lord, whatever it takes, please show me, lead me, guide me, prepare me, equip me so that I can tell my loved one about Christ. And if it's not me that's supposed to lead them to you, Lord, put that person in their life. Because you've got some family and friends that might not listen to you about Jesus, but they might listen to someone else. So... Lord, put someone in their life. Maybe you got someone you don't get along with. Maybe they're, they're almost like an enemy. Pray, God, Jesus, will you restore a relationship and will you put yourself in that relationship? The whole point about today is simply this, is that even though it might not happen immediately, if you trust and be obedient to God, it will happen. Oh, it's going to happen. I believe that with all my heart. And today, we might not be a packed congregation. But you know what? Simeon didn't go to the temple because it was a packed group there. He went there because he went every time looking. I'm looking for the Messiah. And eventually he found him. You don't come here for other people. You don't come here for me. You come here because you're able to sing about the Messiah. You're able to hear teaching about the Messiah. You're able to hear preaching about the Messiah. You're able to give gifts because the God Messiah has blessed you and you want to show that blessing back and through missions and other activities. But the whole point of this is simply that at Christmas, you are going to get what you're looking for if you're looking for the Messiah. And when you find him, you can die happy. Amen. That's it. Let's pray.